my name is Giovanna Scorsone. I'm the Education Manager here today, and we're very excited to have Dr. Walter B. Denny to talk to us today about the uh, influences of the Ottomans in Italy and uh, how those cross-cultural connections have really um, influenced various cultures in many directions. Our mission here at the Aga Khan Museum is to connect cultures through art and to talk about you know, the positive interactions between cultures um, so that we can inspire understanding and empathy and really work towards a uh, greater pluralistic society. So uh, this is a great start for us here today. And hopefully you've had a chance to see the exhibit, Arts of the East, highlights from the Bruschettini collection. Um, but if you haven't, there is time after the talk today, and I'm sure that it will give you uh, a wonderful insight as you look at the beautiful uh, objects, those magnificent carpets on display. Now, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the land on which the Aga Khan Museum sits, known as Takaranto, and honor the stewardship, past, present, and future, of the Huron-Wendat, the Iroquois Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the New Credit. Now, this is a good time to remind you to turn your cell phones to silent and that there are no photos or videos to be taken during the lecture. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our speaker, Dr. Walter B. Denny. Dr. Denny is a distinguished professor of art history at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, specializing in the art of the Islamic world. Since 2007, he has served as senior consultant in the Department of Islamic Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. After his undergraduate studies at Robert College, Grinnell College, and Oberlin College, and graduate studies at Harvard and at Istanbul Technical University, he completed his PhD dissertation at Harvard in 1970 and began his teaching career at UMass Amherst in September of that year. His research interests concentrate in the Ottoman Turkish sphere, including architecture, design and painting, carpets, silk textiles, and ceramics. For four decades, he has also taught, pursued research, and published on the thousand-year history of East-West interchange in European culture. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Walter B. Denny to the podium. Thank you. Good afternoon. I don't think I'm going to have any trouble projecting. <clears throat> uh, the microphone is somewhat superfluous, but in case uh, we have a little bit of it to, to make things a little bit easier for folks. Uh, since uh, I'm very glad to be here, to be in this wonderful museum for the very first time in my life, I, I'm ashamed to say I hadn't gotten up here earlier. Uh, and uh, I'm especially honored to be here in connection with this particular exhibition of the Bruscatini Collection. Uh, for reasons which we'll get to in a, in a second here. So when I was asked to, to give this uh, talk, it took me back to a time, actually long before this photograph was taken, when I was 33 years old. Uh, that was 42 years ago, so you can figure <laughs> out how old I am by doing simple addition. When I first met Alessandro Briscatini, in Genoa, in Italy. I was a young professor trying desperately to get photographs of good works of art to show to my students at the University of Massachusetts. And Alessandro, who was only a little teeny bit older than I was at the time, was already a distinguished collector with a very famous and uh, uh, collection of Islamic art, which included a large amount of material from my period. And it was even more interesting to me uh, when I was able to visit him in his home uh, in the middle of packing up and moving to a different place. He basically unpacked a week's worth of packing to show me his treasures back then. And he's had a special place in my heart since, which was recently, or more recently, uh, reaffirmed with his magnificent exhibition at the Palazzo Lomellino in Venice. Uh, sorry, in, Genoa. wash my mouth out with soap. Genoa, excuse me, please. Apologies to all Genoese here. Uh, that, that's, that's not a mistake uh, one should ever, ever make. So what I'm talking to you about today is not strictly about Islamic art per se, but about the interaction between Italy and the Ottoman Empire in the time of the Renaissance. Uh, and uh, especially as that interaction is seen through works of art. So we're dealing basically with this theater and that is the Mediterranean. 
And one of the things that we are increasingly aware of now, especially given the way that historians have been uh, changing their focus of, uh, of study over the past half century from the deeds of mighty kings and admirals and generals to, uh, to looking at the way things were with ordinary people, we have a new understanding of the Mediterranean and the Mediterranean society due to the pioneering work of, uh, of a French historian named Fernand Brodel and his, uh, and his many students, including a number of distinguished Turkish scholars as well. <clears throat> And there is something, so this is basically a neighborhood that we're looking at here. And uh, we understand now that um, people for a very, very long time, long before the invention of the jet plane, people had a very, a very clear and easy understanding of what was going on in the Mediterranean from one end to another. The discovery of documents like the Cairo Geniza, which uh, was a, a, in the 19th century a discovery of basically what you might call 300 years of little pieces of paper that in our society we would attach to our refrigerator door with magnets. But 300 years of this uh, has given us an idea of a Mediterranean society in which uh, there was a great deal of communication and a great deal of sophistication and knowledge from one end to the other. Now, the relationship between Italy in particular and the Middle East goes back a, a very long time, the Islamic Middle East goes back a very, very long time in legend, according to uh, Venetian uh, mythology in 828. The city of Venice, which had a sort of a, what you might call a middling B-level saint as its patron saint, decided to move into the big time when a couple of Venetian enterprising businessmen uh, basically made off with the, uh, the holy relic consisting of the body of St. Mark, who for 800 years looked surprisingly in good shape, in <laughs> Tintoretto's painting here, and brought it to Venice. Now, the stealing of holy relics was, as some of you probably know, not such an extraordinary thing at this time. Uh, my favorite little Romanesque church in southern France, Conk, uh, it, uh, it uh, basically, uh, the, the same thing, the, the saint who is revered there used to belong to a neighboring town until a midnight raid carried her bones off to Conk. So this happened all the time. And today, of course, St. Mark's is the patron saint of Venice, the, great, the greatest church in Venice and one of the most famous churches in the world is named after St. Mark. Now that's back in the realm of mythology, but in fact we have a very strong record, at least from the 11th century onward in Italy, of the cultural interfaces that existed between the Islamic world and the world of, uh, and the world of Italy. One of the most important of these is Amalfi, uh, which you see here on the left-hand side. Most of us may know it from uh, a very picturesque drive and somewhat terrifying drive if you're actually behind the wheel, uh, uh, the Amalfi Drive in southern Italy. Uh, but the church, the Cathedral of Amalfi, is one of the most striking examples that we have of the impact of Islamic architecture, both from Spain and from Egypt, upon the, uh, upon the architecture of Italy and the Amalfian commerce with, between Amalfi, uh, uh, Amalfi and Alexander in Egypt, maritime commerce is very well developed and very well documented. Equally well known today is another important Italian interface, if you consider Sicily a part of Italy, which some do and some don't. And uh, that, uh, I, I'm showing you here, the uh, interior of the palace known as La Cuba in, um, in Palermo. The word Cuba actually is taken directly from the Arabic word Cuba. It means the dome. Uh, and this palace is, in fact, along with, a, along with a couple of other palaces near Palermo, the only evidence we have for what palace architecture in North Africa looked like at this time, because all the palaces in, the, in, in Cairo themselves were completely destroyed uh, from this period uh, at, with, a, with a change of regime in Cairo. So if we go to European cathedral treasuries and museums, we find an incredibly rich record through the centuries of artistic commerce with the Islamic world. The little ivory here on the left-hand side in the Bargello in Florence uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, one of the greatest surviving examples we have of the art of the Fatimids, a Shiite dynasty that ruled in Egypt in the, uh, in the 11th, 12th centuries. The, uh, Probably the most spectacular object in Saint, in San Marco in Venice is this uh, also Fatimid Egyptian rock crystal ewer that you see here, which is uh, 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 was to Europeans at the time quite miraculous, a, a, a piece of solid something that you could look right through. Uh, they didn't know what this was. It had to be magic. 
And uh, the, the uh, fragment of silk that you see over there, equally interesting, uh, it's part of the grave goods of a man named uh, Congrande de la Scala, who, among other things, was the principal patron of the poet Dante in the, uh, in the uh, uh, 14th century, uh, but when he died, he was wrapped up in a Mongol silk from, uh, from Iran. We, we continually run into, in odd places in Europe, this is the Campo Santo in, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, Pisa, uh, strange and wondrous objects that don't seem to have much of a place in European material culture. Uh, we don't know for sure where this uh, rather awesome example, the largest metal object to have survived from the Middle Ages from the Islamic world. Uh, you can see the holes in it were the result of uh, firearm practice uh, in, in a later time. It's in a rather unpleasant location right in front of the uh, great fresco of the triumph of death that was created during the Black Plague. And then you see this very foreboding object, which was probably a uh, throne guardian uh, sculpture either from uh, Spain or uh, from uh, Egypt uh, in, the, uh, in the early Middle Ages, but almost certainly not from Sasanian Iran, despite, uh, despite uh, uh, an avid partisanship of that origin on the part of a colleague of mine who was also associated with this institution uh, at some distance now. Uh, and we have to remember that long before the conquest of Constantinople by the Turks in 1453, uh, the city we today call Istanbul, formerly Constantinople, uh, had a very close relationship because of Mediterranean commerce with the extraordinary trading states of Italy. And among these different Italian states, we always think of Venice and its relationship with the East, but in fact, it was Genoa that was the really important trading state during most of the uh, High Middle Ages. and uh, and. Uh, and the uh, relationship, uh, the Genoese quarter, uh, the former Genoese quarter at Istanbul, still dominated by this, uh, this tower here known as Galata, was the main European trading headquarters. The Genoese were there, the Venetians were also there, uh, and uh, a number of other Italian uh, communities had their, had their uh, presence there. This is why the Roman Catholic Cathedral of, of, of Constantinople, of Istanbul today, uh, is, uh, is the cathedral, the patron saint, uh, is uh, the cathedral of St. Anthony of Padua. Uh, St. Anthony of Padua in Constantinople. It sounds a little bit strange, um, no more strange than the fact perhaps that the, uh, the Roman Catholic Bishop of Constantinople is the, uh, along with the one in Venice, are the only two that I know of in the Catholic Church who are not called bishops but are called patriarchs. And uh, by the way, this position was held not such a long time ago by a man named Giovanni Roncalli, who became uh, Pope John the 23rd, uh, the only Turkish-speaking pope, and therefore, in my books, the best pope. <laughs> now, we know a lot about this trading quarter in Constantinople. Here's a, here's a plan of the city, a kind of a, of a bird's eye view, done by a, a Turkish painter in around 1537, sometime around then. And uh, we can see on one side of the harbor, on the right-hand side, the peninsula of Constantinople itself, of Istanbul, with a large number of Ottoman buildings already by this time. And the, uh, the other page, with it surrounded by the tower, this, this, this double page uh, has multiple perspectives. You really need to turn on its side to see that is the European trading quarter. And you can see that it's about uh, uh, this map. Uh, it, it's nowhere near actually a quarter of the size of Constantinople, but it's very interesting that it was given such prominence by this Turkish painter at the time. So 1453 is the date we all remember as the conquest of Constantinople by the redoubtable Turkish Sultan uh, Mehmet II shown here in both an Italian portrait and a Turkish portrait, uh, both of them allegedly made from life in his own lifetime between 1451, well, they're later than that, certainly, and uh, certainly no later than, uh, than 1481 when he, uh, when he died. And I show you the, uh, a mural, a rather dramatic mural of the conquest of Constantinople from the Military Museum in Istanbul. What a lot of us don't remember is how very, very aggressive the Turkish, uh, the Turkish military onslaught in Europe was back in these days that shortly uh, before, uh, well, in, 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 uh, in 1480, the town of Otranto on the very heel of Italy up there was for several months 
actually occupied by the Turks. Something we know even less and don't like to think about, perhaps even more, was that all during the 16th century, the Turkish fleet was able to rely upon harbor privileges in Toulon on the Mediterranean. Toulon, as you probably know today, is the, the major naval base for the French Navy. Uh, uh, and uh, it was, uh, it was uh, used by the Ottoman Navy quite extensively in the 16th century uh, on the age-old Middle Eastern principle since both the French and the Turks were enemies of the Habsburgs that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. This is a somewhat uh, overblown by today's cartographic standards uh, a depiction of the Ottoman Empire at its geographical zenith. Uh, uh, including a little teeny bit of white on the heel of Italy you can see up there as well uh, from, a, from an atlas that was published many years ago. I, there are better maps, but the trouble with these better maps is that they're graphically rather nondescript. So I like the old map because it just looks prettier and it's a lot easier, especially when one is dealing with a, an audience of, uh, of 17 to 21 year olds. I find it a little bit easier to use this map than a, a somewhat more sophisticated one. Now we also know that the conflict between so-called East and West, between the terms Islamic world, the world of the Ottoman Empire, and the Christian world, if we could call it that, the world, the world of, of, of Roman Catholic, especially Roman Catholic Europe at this time, was to a certain extent ideological. It was based, of course, on religion and religious conquest. But in the Mediterranean, it was above everything else, when you really get down to it, a war over commerce and who was going to control the extremely lucrative commerce in the Mediterranean. Because the Ottoman Turks, everybody needed money at these days, something that we still need all the time. And this is a particular problem in what we call an age of bullionism. That is, when armies were paid in precious metals, silver, and the main source of that precious metal in the European economy, especially uh, in the later 16th century, was from mines in the Western Hemisphere in Central and South America. And uh, this resulted in intense uh, commercial rivalry in the Mediterranean because all countries, but especially the Ottomans, where the entire economy was built on silver, uh, needed this precious metal. And so Ottomans and Venetians were constantly fighting with each other only to discover that when they fought with, to gain control of trade routes, only to discover that, when that while they were fighting with each other, there was no trade going on and they were missing the taxation from, from, from the trade. And so these wars always lasted a very short time. This is not such an unusual thing. Uh, in the early 16th century, the Turkish Sultan uh, declared war on uh, Shiite Persia. Uh, unfortunately, most of his governmental funding in those days was coming from taxing the silk trade between Shiite Persia and the Ottoman Empire. And so all of a sudden, he was in a war and no way of paying his soldiers. So when he died, uh, his son very, very quickly repaired relations because everybody needed money. This, this happened more recently uh, in, the, in the early days of World War I when uh, Russia declared war on Germany. Uh, the Tsar of Russia, and a tremendously wonderful patriotic gesture said that all patriotic Russians were going to give up, I know this is hard to believe, drinking vodka until the war was over. <laughs> uh, forgetting that 40% of the revenue of the Russian state came from its monopoly on the sale of vodka. So uh, that's, what, th th that's this very interesting situation that we have here, and it's largely commercial rivalry. Now the land conquests were a different matter. On land, the Ottomans faced uh, the uh, the uh, non-maritime Habsburgs, not the Habsburgs so much of Spain, but the Habsburgs of Austria. And this resulted, uh, among other things, in the 1520s, in the Turks establishing themselves in the suburbs of Vienna, uh, in a siege which uh, was, however, lifted uh, when the, uh, when, uh, the uh, fall rains approached. For an awfully long time, from uh, certainly from the Battle of Nicopolis in 1399 all the way down to the second part of the 16th century, it looked like the Ottomans were unstoppable. And then in 1571, uh, a great naval battle took place in, uh, 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 between uh, the Peloponnesus and, uh, and, the, uh, and the Greek mainland on the, on the west side of, of Corinth. Uh, and the Battle of Lepanto, the Ottomans suffered a crushing defeat. I say the Ottomans 
and not the Turks for a very specific reason here and that all of their most capable naval commanders, uh, many of them were, uh, were uh, actually Italians who had converted to Islam. And their most successful, the Turks most, the Ottomans most successful commander at this battle, in fact, was uh, a man who was uh, named Kulic Ali Pasha, who was uh, of Italian origin. Uh, it's sometimes overlooked that a year after Lepanto, uh, with the Turkish fleet having been mostly destroyed, uh, so great was the economic power of the Ottoman Empire that uh, they produced over, uh, they, they created hundreds and hundreds of ships in one winter, and the next, uh, by the next summer, their fleet was almost back to the strength that it had been before this battle. But for Italians especially, because there were lots of Italians involved in this battle, there were lots of Spanish too, by the way, uh, Don Miguel de Cervantes, author of uh, Don Quixote, was in this battle. Uh, and captured by Muslim pirates on his way back to Spain and spent some time in captivity. Very interesting, that's another interesting story for another exhibition in another museum probably, but uh, uh, at any rate, Lepanto was the turning point of the European psyche. It proved that the Ottomans were, especially on sea, on land they were very hard to stop, but on sea they could be beaten and it resulted in an enormous spate of celebration all over Europe, the most interesting of which I saw in Genoa uh, just a short time ago in the Doria Palace there, a series of tapestries uh, depicting every single stage of the battle in minute detail together with, uh, with accompanying uh, legends telling you exactly who was on what ship and what they were doing. Uh, but this became a sort of a touchstone in a, in, a, in a different phase of a European and especially of Italian relationship with the mysterious East, or the not-so-mysterious East. Now, we might well ask ourselves the question, what, in fact, in the time of the Renaissance, do Italians know about their uh, aggressive next-door neighbor who was occupying their Achilles tendon for a while and, uh, and was a constant, uh, a constant and looming threat? Because remember, the Ottomans were also moving into what is today, what, what used to be Yugoslavia, what is today Croatia, and were not such a great distance away from Trieste and from Venice itself uh, for a, a, an extremely long time, for several centuries. So we, I, what I said here was they do a lot and they didn't know very much at all, and they knew both of these things mainly through art. Uh, my colleague Julian Raby, who is the uh, uh, and director of the Freer Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., has uh, published a very interesting little book on Italian, uh, on what he called the, uh, uh, well, the Ottoman mode, basically uh, a, a series of, uh, or uh, a series of paintings made in, especially in Venice, in the, uh, in the 15th century, which show us how little Italians really knew about the East. Uh, Carpaccio was the, the, the leading painter in this, and, and he was showing events that were taking place, supposedly, in his way of thinking, uh, in, a, in a kind of an Egyptian context. Now, Italians were well aware of the fact that Jesus lived at the time of Jesus and at the time of, of, of the early Christian movement, that uh, these events took place in the Middle East. Uh, and, that is, and they knew that the Middle East was at present time uh, not under Christian domination. And they also knew, because everyone in Europe knew about the history of the Crusades. And we get a very interesting kind of, in, in, six, in 15th century Italian painting, a very interesting picture of the Middle East. Sometimes it's sort of neutral, these two turbaned figures listening to the young St. Stephen preach. You know, he's going to get martyred, he's going to be stoned to death. And on this side over here, a sort of a quasi-Turkish figure being cast in the role of King Herod, ordering the massacre of all the innocent children of Bethlehem uh, when he heard of the birth of the King of the Jews in that city. So it was the first half of the, uh, of the uh, uh, 15th century, in particular, if we look, at, uh, if we look at, at, at Italian art, we find some very, very insightful work, but we also find that uh, it, was, uh, it wasn't until the capture of Constantinople in 1453 that they began to really start taking their neighbors to the east seriously. Now we have a number of events that took place during the reign of Mehmet the Second, Mehmet the Conqueror, the first Turkish uh, sultan to a rule, uh, the one who conquered Constantinople and who ruled then for about 30 years afterwards. And one of the most interesting things is that uh, uh, this, uh, this individual uh, was uh, able to speak not only Turkish, he knew Arabic, he knew Persian, uh, 
He was evidently able to read Latin because he actually collected a number of books, mainly on war and, strat and, and strategic things, uh, uh, in, in Latin, which supposedly he was able to read himself. We know that he could speak Italian, and that at one point, uh, and, and, and we also know that uh, he was not exactly uh, although revered today as the great Muslim conqueror of Constantinople, that like many great Muslim conquerors, if you examine his life very closely, he was more a Muslim as, well, this is true of politicians, if you examine them more closely, their religion tends to be, should we say, more for show than for, for anything else. Of course, that was true in the past, but I'm sure it's not true anymore. So we see him uh, here, and one of the things that he did was he wrote to the, uh, to the, uh, to the Signoria, uh, to the, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, Serenissima in Venice, and he said, uh, send me your best painter, I want someone to paint my portrait. And so, uh, well, the, the Bellini family was the reigning group of painters in Venice at this time, and they sent the oldest brother, Gentile, was sent off to Constantinople. And uh, he spent two years there, and he painted, among other things, this a peculiar looking portrait on the right hand side up here, uh, which is in the National Gallery in London. There are several other versions of it floating around. Uh, and uh, this is supposedly a reasonable likeness of the Sultan, the rather elderly Sultan at this particular time. I prefer the portrait by the uh, Turkish artist uh, that you see here on the, uh, on the uh, left hand side. But uh, this shows uh, someone who was really very much a Renaissance prince, and he had the same kinds of interests that his contemporaries, uh, the princes of Italy, had. And not only that, but he knew very much what they were doing, and they, to a great extent, knew what he was doing at the time. When Bellini was in Constantinople and Istanbul, and I use those terms, I remember someone once telling me, well, you know, it's been Istanbul since 1453, I said, then how come it is that the coins that were minted there in 1922 still say from the mint of Constantinople, Constantinia? But I, I'm using those terms interchangeably without any prejudice whatsoever to anybody's feelings, uh, I hope. So here are some of the drawings that Bellini made. And he was really uh, quite interested, among other things, in the, in the Turkish... Uh, in the Turkish uh, infantry, the, the feared so-called the Janissaries, the Yenicheri, the, uh, the, the Turkish uh, land troops who were the most formidable infantry in Europe at the time. Uh, he, was able also, he was also able to, uh, to get a number of other people to pose for him. Probably these individuals, by the way, are not Turks. They are probably uh, members of the Italian community who are dressing up for him and posing for him. Uh, he also, uh, if you believe the attribution of the Gardner Museum in Boston and the, and the rather tortuous but fascinating history of the little inscription that you have here on the left-hand side here, this, the inscription says that this is... Uh, a work of Ibn Muezzin, who was a great painter among the Franks. And by a little judicious, uh, complicated, uh, uh, um, uh, what, should, what, should, what should we say, orthographic uh, uh, sleight of hand, it's very easy to see how Bellini could have turned into Muezzini uh, for reasons, among other things, that in Greek you know that, um, that MP is the B sound in Greek. Uh, I went, wanted to go to the Benaki Museum, and I was in Athens, and I, it said right on my map where it was, and I knew, because I'm a college professor and my campus has fraternities, I know the Greek alphabet, right? A little knowledge can be a very dangerous thing, and I noticed that this building, uh, whatever it was, was, was uh, the, it began with an M, not realizing that it was the Umpenaki Museum and mm -mm, um, um, Bellini was the name of, uh, at any rate, a Bellini up here. And amazingly enough, he shows one of his own colleagues, a Turkish painter at work. And at some time, and he's working with, by the way, with a technique which he learned in Constantinople, which is called uh, opaque watercolor, using gum Arabic as the, uh, as the binder. And then uh, uh, a Turkish uh, painter uh, <laughs> paints a, Europe, uh, a Turkish version of the European picture of a Turkish painter. So on an artistic level, there is actually a rather intimate level of interchange that's going on here, if we believe in the, uh, in the provenance of works of art such as this. We can also see it in the works of another European artist, arguably of even more importance than Bellini, even though he doesn't make it into the textbooks as often, a name Costanzo, Costanzo da Ferrara. 
And Costanzo de Ferrara came to Constantinople. The uh, portrait that he did of Sultan Mehmet the Conqueror, which is the best portrait of Mehmet the Conqueror that has survived, is seen in Istanbul album here on the left-hand side. And he also made a rather popular uh, medallion of showing, uh, showing uh, Sultan Mehmet on the front and uh, Sultan Mehmet on horseback on the back that was uh, not only uh, widely uh, admired in Italy, but uh, numerous knockoffs by other sculptures, sculptors were made. And so Sultan Mehmet the Conqueror, through the medium of, of painted ceramic, enters the vernacular uh, imagery of the European world. And in a very interesting way, in the same kind of way that in England, in the early and middle of the 19th century, small figurines of porcelain made in England, English porcelain centers of the notorious Boney, Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, were best sellers. You know, it, it diminishes Napoleon. He was small enough, supposedly, to begin with, but when he's only three inches tall and you could knock him off the mantelpiece and turn him into a series of fragments, uh, he becomes considerably less threatening. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, Pieces of Majolica like this were not used for food. The idea of dumping an enormous portion of pesto, uh, a, 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 a pasta with pesto on the face of, a, of your enemy is, 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 is a nice one, but they were, these things were so valuable they were, they, were used to, they were used as decoration. This becomes really quite common. You'd be surprised at how many depictions of Turks were uh, coming out of the various uh, 16th century Italian uh, Mialica factories, and many of them using the same kind of repertoire, the sultan on horseback or the, sultan, uh, por the sultan's uh, profile that were originally made popular by, these, uh, by the uh, medallions, the best of which was made by an artist who actually saw the sultan and painted him from life. Another good example of the imagery of the Middle East appearing in, uh, in, in that of the West is this uh, this, this uh, marriage chest or cassone in the Metropolitan Museum, a very famous one which supposedly, and this again is in my own mind still something I'm trying to work through, supposedly shows the conquest of the city of Trebizond in Asia Minor, Trabzon today in Turkey, uh, and shows Constantinople in the upper left-hand corner here, clearly labeled by the way, uh, but this is, uh, there have been various interpretations of this. Uh, at one particular point, this was considered to be the only painted uh, um, uh, Cassone, just like this, that it survived, and we've had a close look at it at the Met. We're not even sure that the painted panel really and the chest itself have much to do with each other until they uh, fell into the hands of a dealer sometime in the 19th century. But it's a good example of the sort of everydayness of the Middle East as it gradually uh, permeated Italian thought uh, in the late 15th and then throughout the 16th century. Now, to be sure, this interest was also reciprocated on the other side. Two paintings here that were made by uh, a retired naval officer who became a painter and worked for Sulabad the Magnificent of his two most important uh, contemporaries, his good buddy and friend, Francis I of France, on the bottom here on the left, and uh, his, uh, his lifetime enemy, Charles V, uh, the, Habsburg, uh, the Habsburg ruler, uh, the Habsburg Holy Roman Emperor, shown on top. And just as we have depictions of Constantinople in Italian paintings, we have, especially in Ottoman maritime atlases, many, many depictions of the city of Venice, the city of Genoa, and indeed of Genoese and, uh, and, 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 uh, uh, and Venetian trading posts all over the Mediterranean. At the beginning of the 16th century, the Pope Alexander VI, a pope who is not exactly touted in Roman Catholic history as one of the great Roman Catholic popes. He was of Spanish origin. His name was Borgia. Uh, you may recall he had a daughter, Lucretia, who had rather interesting mythology about her. He had a son, Cesare, even more so. This all resulted in a uh, very m memorable, very short poem by the American humorous poet Ogden Nash, which went, what would you do if you were up a dark alley with Cesare Borgia, and he was coming towards you. <laughs> but, uh, but this, and as a result of this bad press, these spectacular Borgia apartments in the Vatican have been closed until just the last decade been almost impossible to see them. And they have been opened up and restored, and they show an amazing 
group of very complicated fresco paintings by the Sienese painter uh, Pinturicchio. And among them uh, is the painting that you see in the lunette here uh, in this particular room, which I photographed a, a few years ago when I was in Italy. And what we see here is a number of Turkish figures. We see one with a turban astride a horse, and we see another one standing next to the throne of the ruler here, who, uh, and the ruler on the throne is supposedly a portrait of, uh, of uh, Pope Alexander himself. Well, I'm not going to go into all the complex Italian meanings of this, but it's very interesting that we have these two, these two Turkish characters here shown as, in a sort of a court scene. And this is, in fact, not so unusual at all, because at this particular time, we know that the brother of the reigning Turkish sultan uh, had taken refuge in Italy to get away from the old Ottoman family custom that the first brother to reach the throne executed all of his other brothers. And when you had numerous mothers, and, and they were your half-brothers, that could result in quite an interesting bloodbath. And so Jem Sultan took refuge in Italy uh, and, uh, and was accepted in Italy and was at the court until, uh, until the Sultan slipped a little bit of money to the Pope and, uh, and one morning poor Jem Sultan found out that his breakfast didn't agree with him and he was dead by noon. But we can see probably a portrait of this Turkish prince here. Now what does this mean again in a, in a real sense? Is this, something, is this something exotic? Not so at all. Uh, I think that this, uh, this is a... Uh, uh, we, we know that Pinturicchio uh, uh, included portraits of all kinds of contemporary people in, 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 his, in, in his paintings. And what this shows is that at least on the courtly level, even in Rome, let alone in, in Genoa and in, uh, and in uh, Venice, uh, Italians had some idea as to who Turks were and, uh, and how they dressed, and even something about what they were doing in Italy at the time, and they were in Italy at the time. Now, in the, in the 16th century, especially in Venice, there seems to have been a cottage industry in portraits of Turkish sultans. And of course, when they come on the art market, they're always attributed to very important painters like Titian or Veronese, in, this, in these two particular cases here. Uh, if Titian painted all the portraits he is alleged to have painted of Suleiman the Magnificent, he never would have had any time for, uh, for the paintings we know him for better today. He would have done nothing but that. But what we see here, again, is certainly in the popular consciousness, a tremendous interest. These are two different sultans, uh, Bayezid II, uh, and, uh, who was the uh, one who uh, arranged for the death of his half-brother, uh, and, and Suleiman the Magnificent, who reigned after, uh, showed as a very young man. Uh, and uh, how, how do these pictures jibe with what we know about, well, what do we know about how these people actually looked? Well, we actually have a very, very few, uh, uh, Suleiman the Magnificent, we have a couple of portraits that we're almost sure were done from life. And these are, these are quite good. These are, these are not, uh, not so far off the mark. And the fact is that Italians knew what these people looked like. Now, again, in certain places in Italy, you could actually see Turks on the street. And one of those places was um, Venice again. Here is a detail from a, an engraving showing a, a procession of the doge. He's the guy in the, all the way to the, uh, to the right-hand side over here, uh, through, the, through the square at Saint, uh, uh, the Piazza San Marco. Uh, you know he's the doge because the, the umbrella guy is always behind him. And uh, you, if you look up at the balcony in the upper left-hand corner, you can see that among the spectators, we have a, gr a group of people who are very obviously, by their headdress, uh, members of the Turkish trading community in Venice, who were not allowed down in the square, but they were up at the balcony uh, where, with all the women, where all the women were also onlookers. W women and foreigners were kept uh, upstairs during the ceremony. Uh, we'll return to this engraving in a minute because it's got some other important uh, uh, things in it, but uh, just wanted you to be aware of that. And there is this rather remarkable, uh, this is one leaf out of an enormous panorama, uh, uh, multiple prints that were put together on paper to make this panorama of the procession of Suleiman the Magnificent going to the mosque on Friday for the Friday prayers. And uh, we have to understand that this was a big deal in uh, in Istanbul, that every Friday when he was in residence in the city, the Sultan would go to a different mosque to pray, and he would go as the star attraction of a huge parade. 
that included all the different echelons of the Ottoman Empire, in, all the way from, the, from a regiment of foot soldiers to the household cavalry, the so-called spahis of the, of the Sublime Port, uh, the prime minister, the, uh, the, the chief admiral of the navy, and they would all parade through the streets of, of, uh, of Constantinople, of Istanbul, on their way to mosques. And uh, the Europeans would flock to see these things in the same way that criminologists used to elbow each other aside to see who was on the top of Lenin's tomb on May Day, who is standing the closest to Stalin, who is the furthest away, who is going to be you know, given the chop next week, who is rising. They would do the same thing here. We have a, a remarkable account by the Habsburg ambassador of how he rented the second floor of a house so that he could look at the parade and see whether or not Suleiman was in good health or not. He decided he wasn't in good health, and he, and he probably wasn't. And then in, uh, in 1576, uh, one of the most remarkable European bestsellers of all time, originally writ written in French, uh, was translated into Italian. Uh, the first edition that came out had a very poor, uh, was very poorly illustrated. The second edition, uh, and this is a uh, uh, from the complete second, on this side over here, uh, for the complete second edition that the, the, the late Edwin Benny the third gave to the Harvard University uh, Rare Book Library, had an amazing array of pictures of all kinds of people from everyday life, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker from the Ottoman Empire, uh, together with pictures of women, which of course were of great interest to Europeans because they, uh, well, women are great of great interest to Europeans today too, but uh, the idea was that of course they were not uh, on view on the streets of, uh, of, of the Muslim city back then, so they were all the more fascinating. We we're always much more interested in what we can't see, in this case the, the harem, than we are uh, in, in, uh, in what we can see. And this, uh, these images became very popular, they were copied, uh, 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 Rip-off editions came out, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and for the, in succeeding centuries, the illustrations of this particular book uh, became all, all, almost, again, an, an industry in Europe all the way through the Baroque as copies of it were made uh, and, and widely disseminated as a, as a ch cheap and quick source of revenue for, for artists down on their luck. But it is, of course, what we, what we think of in the West from this period is we think of the great Venetian paintings that all show, that have this Ottoman presence in them. Uh, this is uh, uh, a Titian, it looks very much like the Bassano, that's the same, exact same composition, showing the adoration of the wise men, and of course in European tradition, one of the wise men was, uh, was, had, had dark skin, and he is the one that is always shown with a turban on it uh, here, uh, the adoration of the Christ child here, and we have the East, we know that they, we, I remember as a kid wondering, what is Orientar? We three kings of Orientar. But uh, the, uh, the, uh, they're from Orientar, and therefore they have the costumes that one would expect from that part of the world, and that a sophisticated Viennese, uh, uh, sorry, Venetian audience would, of course, expect to see. Maybe you haven't noticed it, but probably the most famous early work of Titian, which is the Pesaro Madonna, uh, uh, there is a Turkish captive. Uh, the Pesaros had a very, small and insignificant sea victory, they captured a Turkish ship. And uh, as a result, they're shown, uh, not only the family is shown here, kneeling in front of the Virgin in St. Peter and St. Francis, but in the corner back here, we have the distinctive turban of a, of a, a Turkish captive, sort of a, a votive offering, you might say, uh, to the Virgin Mary. Now, this is all pretty straightforward stuff, and it shows us a Europe whose, in, whose artists uh, especially the Venetian ones, but also throughout Italy, people had a pretty good idea of what Turks looked like, and they probably had a pretty good idea of what they were like as well. We don't see very many examples of these cr cruel Herod-like figures in 16th century Italian painting. There is one painting, however, that gives me a little bit of a, a pause, and that is this. Uh, you've all been to the Louvre, you've been to the Louvre, you know, that. Uh, this is the huge painting on the wall where everybody else is looking at the Mona Lisa. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's Veronese's first great banquet painting, and it's called The uh, uh, Miracle at, uh, of the Marriage at Cana, the first of Christ's miracles where he changes uh, water into wine, uh, something we'd all like to be able to do when the bottles run out at a party. But, uh, and, uh, 
The most important thing about this painting, I should tell you, because I'm married to a professional musician whose instrument is the viola da gamba, is the uh, group of viola da gamba players in the foreground. But, uh, and I could talk to you for hours and hours just on their instruments. However, we're not going to look at them because at the table back here on the right-hand side, there is somebody in a funny hat, a very funny hat. And uh, right above the fellow in green in the foreground, lost in the shadows back there is a bearded figure that has actually a turban on it. Now, there's a, a, a Veronese scholars are very fond of identifying all the people in this painting. We know that, for instance, he showed himself as one of the gamba players here. And it is thought that the fellow over here uh, with a funny hat is Suleiman the Magnificent, and that the figure uh, in the background there in the shadows, there are other turban figures, but that particular figure is Sokolu Mehmet Pasha, the Turkish Grand Vizier at the time. Well, you know, th this sounds so wonderful, except that when I look closely at this painting, uh, and I know what Venetians know about Ottomans at the time, why in the world would Suleiman the Magnificent being sh be shown with this funny hat uh, when he could be wearing, or, or for that matter, Sokolov Mehmet Pasha, when everybody in Venice at this date knew exactly what a Turk wore as a headdress. And by the way, there is an entire funny hat industry. I'll show you two of the funnier ones here. The uh, El Gran Turco uh, here, uh, this is a bit of, uh, this is the hat supposedly that when the last of the Byzantine em emperors traveled to Italy in a desperate attempt to raise funds for the defense of Constantinople at the very end, uh, he wore a hat like this. And so when the Turks came along, they gave him the same kind of hat. Uh, the one on the far side is the creation of a Venetian jeweler who thought he was going to make a fortune by selling this to Suleiman the Magnificent. Uh, and Suleiman the Magnificent would have done almost anything to avoid appearing in a hat that looked like this in public. Uh, he would have went to probably as great a lengths as I would go to avoid wearing a hat like that in public. Uh, and it, the deal never went through, but this was part of, the, part of the commercial propaganda of the time. It looks surprisingly like the papal tiara with the multiple crowns on it. And I already mentioned to you that these images the, of the real thing, of the, tur the turban images, were so popular that there was, as I said, a cottage industry of these things. They appear on the art market all the time. I may have a couple of dozen of them now in my archive at home. And another reason for deciding that maybe the, these, fanciful, these fanciful things are, are, are not supposed to literally depict Ottomans is the fact that since the 14th century, one of the largest and most handsome buildings in Venice uh, has been known as the Fondaco de Turki. This is the place, uh, this was the place where at various times the Turks were ghettoized. They were not allowed to leave the building, uh, but uh, where the Turkish tr trading community in Venice hung out. And uh, today it's, of course, the Museum of Natural History, but uh, it, 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 as, as early as the 14th century, it served as the Ottoman trading headquarters in uh, the Serenissima in, in, in Venice, which meant that Venetians were not, uh, not at all uh, uh, um, surprised when they saw a Turk walking around on the streets. Now, let's take a look at Ottoman luxury goods and see how they fit into this picture. One of the things that fascinates me as someone who's been very interested in the history of carpets for a large part of his life, not so much because I'm interested in carpets, but because other people expect me to be interested in carpets, is paintings like this. This is a very famous picture of the procession of the relic of the True Cross being carried in its reliquary through St. Mark's Square in, uh, in uh, 1496, I believe on, uh, on is it Corpus Christi, I believe. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, there's this enormous parade here in the foreground. Well, that's all very nice. It was painted by, by the way, by our, our old friend uh, Gentile Bellini long after you returned from Turkey. But what interests me is a little hard to see over here, and that is the palace on the left, upper left-hand corner up here, where the women that we saw in the engraving were uh, segregated on the second floor. Uh, and uh, if you look very carefully at this painting, uh, every single one of the openings of that arcade has a Turkish carpet draped over the railing. Uh, that in fact, the display of Turkish carpets becomes a touchstone of civic ritual in almost every Italian town in the 16th century. 
We have, uh, at least in the United States, we have ticker tape and, other, and, and confetti and other things that we can throw at parades. But uh, back in those days when they had a parade, they hung out these Turkish carpets. And we know from documents that the local carpet dealers, recognizing this, would rent out their, if you didn't have your own carpet to hang out, you could rent one from the local carpet dealer just for the day to put over your balcony to dress up the square. And this is an absolutely marvelous custom, but it's in fact much more, I'm surprised actually that more people who write about Italian festivals haven't sort of picked up on this. We certainly see the carpets here. Every single balcony aperture on the second floor has a carpet draped over the outside. And I can even tell you some of these are particular types of carpets that I, I could recognize from their patterns. Well, we all, all we always knew this was true in Venice, but then the more we start looking at things, the more we start things, things, things like this. This is another one of those cassones. Uh, there are a pair of them. One of them is in the Bargello in Florence. The other was, one is in Cleveland, Ohio. This is the one in Cleveland. And it shows the palio. You all know about the horse race in Siena, the famous palio. Well, there's one in Florence that used to be held on the festival of St. John the Baptist. And this is uh, 1418. And it, we see recognizable uh, basically 15th century Turkish animal carpets. Again, decorating. It's not the most wonderful painting in the world, by the way. I hope nobody thinks I'm showing you this is a great work of art, but it's a fantastic piece of documentation, isn't it? If you go to the town hall in San Gimignano, you find this carpet. It must be Christian, it's in the shape of a cross. No, it's a special carpet that was meant to go on top of a table. Tables like this are unknown in the Islamic world. It was specifically made for export to Italy and the four flaps would hang down on the side of the table. There's another one in the Victoria and Albert Museum, uh, which is more frequently seen, but this one is actually, or the last time I was there, was still on display in the, uh, in the main hall of the, San, uh, of the town hall in San Gimignano. Some years back, my colleague Alberto Borlevi, who some of you may have encountered at the time of the symposium here on September the 24th, 25th, uh, at this museum, uh, Alberto, who I call the, uh, for carpet studies the luckiest man alive, because he lives in Italy, first of all, and to live in Italy, you're one of the luckiest people in the world. And uh, Alberto has made the two most important carpet discoveries of the 20th century, and one of them was uh, being called over to the Pitti Palace. We've just found something in the garderoba, two enormous cylinders rolled up, wrapped up in, in, in uh, uh, cheap cloth, and we think there's something of interest to you inside of them. So they unroll these things and find the largest Mamluk carpet in existence, only it's not really Mamluk. They're both Ottoman from Cairo, uh, but Ottoman carpets, one with an Ottoman design on the left-hand side, the largest of its type, and one in traditional Mamluk design on the right-hand side, the largest of its type, both of them in a condition as though they were made yesterday. Not a single knot out of place. The delicate fringes, which would disappear if you walked on them for an hour, are still there. Better still, the original bills of sale rolled up right inside. Now, this is something that we pray for as art historians, right? And here it actually happened. Uh, the only, and you know, I, I, I love Alberto, and I'm just as glad that it happened to him uh, than me. It should have happened to him because he lives in Florence, and not only that, his Italian is a lot better than mine. At any rate, uh, this is the sort of thing. Why are they in such good shape? Well, in fact, the reason is probably that by the time these two carpets ended up in Italy, the bloom was off the rose for, for foreign goods. They were, the Italians were beginning to look toward European production, and the carpets were no longer as highly prized as they had been in earlier times. The other great carpet discovery of modern times, also made by Alberto Borlevi, it's a rediscovery, is this extraordinary little carpet which turned up in a bank vault in Padua. It belonged to the local synagogue. It is beyond any question Egyptian. That is, the material in it is Egyptian wool. The border is a, is a, a late an Ottoman period Mamluk border, Mamluk carpet border. It looks like a Turkish prayer rug in the center with the arch. You'll notice that there's an intimation up at the top of of Italian one-point perspective in the way that the capitals are angled. And it has an inscription, which you can't see in this slide above it, from the book of Psalms. This is the gate of the Lord, through it the righteous enter, in Hebrew. The flames coming out of the brazier here at the bottom are from a Ottoman Turkish motif called Tintamani. Uh, so uh, he published this as 
Un tapeto a rug. What did he say? Ebraico, turco, uh, ebraico, uh, italo, egiziano. A, a, a Turkish, uh, uh, Egyptian, Italian carpet. Uh, 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 Hebrew carpet. So uh, what this shows us is something very interesting, and that is that artistic goods were not only traveling all over the place, but that they were traveling in all kinds of different milieus. One of the other things that Alberto has, has discovered and hasn't yet fully published is intimations that at the court of Ferrara, the Este family, you know, the family which in the, around the year 1500 gave us the viola da gamba, which was probably as a family of instruments invented for, uh, for Isabella d'Este, uh, the great patron of, of, of the arts of that time, that the Este family was tired of paying extortionate prices to the Venetians for um, for uh, Egyptian carpets, and it appears that they may have brought a weaver over from Cairo to weave carpets in Italy. Uh, not only that, but the weaver's name strongly suggests, although he came from Cairo, that he was Jewish. So there are all kinds of interesting things going on here that works of art are telling us that, uh, and once we get the work of art, we can look for the documents. Sometimes the documents lead the way. I will say as an art historian, most of the time, we need to have the works of art leading the way for us. So carpets acquire, in Italian art, their own symbolic significance. They are a symbol of sanctity, of holy ground. Now think about this, this is not such a peculiar thing. In the description of Palm Sunday from the Gospels, we find out that when Christ came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, some people who welcomed him as the king of the Jews took off their garments and laid them in the road in front of him. You all know the story of Queen Elizabeth the first of England and Sir Walter Raleigh, how he put down his very valuable cloak down in a mud puddle so she wouldn't get her feet muddy. The idea of walking on a precious textile automatically has connotations with royalty and has had them for probably several millennia. So we shouldn't be at all surprised in this wonderful altarpiece by Montaigne to see a spectacularly beautiful, what we call now, don't ask me why, it's called a small pattern Holbein carpet but never mind, that's just the name, uh, under the feet of the Virgin Mary. Now this is not a one-off by any means. There are hundreds and hundreds of European paintings depicting carpets. When I give my course at the University of Massachusetts on the history of the Islamic carpet, uh, we spend uh, for several weeks there at the beginning more time probably looking at European paintings than we do at carpets themselves. But this just gives you a good, a, a good example. Uh, Vincenzo Foppa, Brera Gallery, upper left. Uh, um, uh, Verrocchio, um, Leonardo's teacher, uh, down here, uh, lower left. Uh, Ghirlandaio, Michelangelo's painting teacher, uh, lower right. Uh, an unknown Italian master, uh, or maybe not the greatest master in the world, from the museum in Budapest up there. I get very nervous when I see undiapered children on a valuable carpet. And, uh, and in the center, uh, a wonderful painting by Bassano uh, in, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, museum, the old, the old painting museum, the Alta Pinacotech in Munich. Uh, and let me tell you something. These artists uh, knew what they were doing. I can practically do a technical analysis. I can certainly tell you that Bassano got the spin and twist of the warp correct in his portrayal over there. This was a carpet on display in Genoa in the Bruscatini exhibition in Genoa of the very, very same sort that you see over here. So everybody knew about carpets and carpets had this particular symbolism and we see it over and over again. We call Lotto carpets Lotto carpets because they appear in this painting by Lorenzo Lotto. Although the really interesting carpet in this painting is the one on the second tier, not the one that's hanging over the edge at the bottom. A similar carpet you see over there and this painting by Giovanni uh, uh, Dudine of, uh, of St. Mark. Carpets were also a signifier of good taste and learning. Carpets in portraits almost invariably appear with symbols of literacy, an inkwell and a text. The inkwell is a little bit ominous again because conservators, you know how they are about these things. And, uh, and uh, you keep thinking, what if it were tipped over? Well, in fact, we have lots of carpets that show that inkwells were tipped over. But this is, the, this is a Lotto carpet, even though the uh, painter is not Lotto. Another association, now I could, I, the, these were not cherry-picked. 
I could show you two or three dozen Italian portraits, all of which have the same paraphernalia on the table. An open book, an inkwell, a pen, the whole business. Not to mention the French ones and the Dutch ones and the Flemish ones. Carpet also became, in a very peculiar way, a symbol of dom domesticity and family, gathering together around the carpet as though the carpet was something very, very special. And we see that in two paintings by Lato here. Carpets were also an allegory of touch. When we see paintings that emphasize the senses, and now we're here, this is the only Baroque painting you're going to see today, sorry, uh, a Caravaggio on loan to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And above all, they were denoters of gracious living. This is the Palazzo Salvadego in Brescia. We don't know exactly who painted it, uh, probably a workshop of a, of a well-known painter, but the carpets, in this case, Mamluk carpets from Egypt, are from Ottoman Egypt, are everywhere. I couldn't help but include this picture of the 2013 uh, Venice Biennale, Rudolf Stengel's uh, complete furnishing of, in, uh, of a palazzo in Venice with gigantic images of the very same not too wonderful carpet, but it's quite something, certainly. Repetition, in this case, gone absolutely crazy. So just to remind you, and I'm, I realize we're running a little bit over at time, I want just to show you that uh, Italy was also fascinated, fascinated with Ottoman ceramics. Venice made copies of a certain group of Ottoman blue and whites. And when I was recently in Genoa, I saw a whole series of Genoese carpets, this drug pot here on the left-hand side, uh, that were very, very close copies in their design of a Turkish type that you see on the other side. We've known for centuries that Padua produced imitations of, uh, of uh, Turkish uh, ceramics. The piece on the right-hand side, by the way, is from the, uh, is from the Bruscatini collection. If you've ever been to the cathedral uh, in Siena, which has the red, uh, sorry, has the black and white striped masonry, caused a professor of mine, an undergraduate professor, to refer to it as the Holy Zebra. In the, uh, in the choir, which is today a kind of a, uh, an art gallery, we have these very interesting little tiles on the floor, and they show the transfer of what was recognized as the ultimate good luck symbol, so-called chintamani, that's a Sanskrit word, it means auspicious jewel. Originally, its origin is in Buddhist art. It moves into the Islamic world as early as the ninth century in Iraq, and then by the time of Timur in around the year 1400, it's being used on the coinage, and then it becomes in Ottoman times, as you would see in these velvets at the bottom here, a sort of a symbol both of masculinity and of, uh, of good luck. And this, uh, and so we shouldn't be at all surprised to see it on the floor of Siena Cathedral, should we? Works both ways. Venetian velvets, 15th century Venetian velvets shipped to Turkey, resulted in, an, in a, in a two-century-long tradition of Turkish carpets that have designs that are copied from Venetian velvets. When I was starting out in Islamic art back in the early 70s, and I went to Istanbul, I would see kaftan, kaftan on display at the Topkapı Palace. Belonged to one of the Turkish sultans, has a very Turkish design, tulips, all the things we, and we thought these kaftans are Great works of Ottoman Turkish art, and they were the velvets we all talked about as Ottoman velvets. They're not Ottoman at all. They're Italian. Why did the Turkish sultans wear Italian velvets? Because anybody could go out to the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul and buy Ottoman velvets. But these were imported. In other words, it's the Armani syndrome, all right? <laughs> and the reason we know this is because they are in a technique we call alto basso. I mean, it's, it's, it, this is not rocket science which uses both looped and cut velvet and is a purely Italian technique. The Italians were pretty good at this, by the way. Some of the most beautiful Turkish velvets are these Italian ones. I have to tell you, here's another one with gigantic tulips. And this one here. And in fact, we know that there was a thriving trade, which uh, Louise Mackey, formerly of the Royal Ontario Museum in this city, uh, documented very well in the book called Epec that she and Dorhan Atasoy and I wrote together, an entire class of, of, of Turkish velvets that aren't Turkish at all. They were made in Italy for the Turkish market. This doesn't mean we don't find Turkish velvets in Italy. There was a wonderful little show at Genoa showing uh, Turkish, velvet, uh, Turkish textiles incorporated into various ecclesiastical uh, vestments gleaned from the various churches of Genoa. And we have a certain amount 
of documentation that shows us that even Turkish fashion, as early as the Renaissance, by the way, by the 18th century, Turkish fashion was everywhere in Europe, uh, especially after the publication of the letters of uh, an English woman named Mary Wortley Montague. Everybody was wearing Turkish women, especially wearing Turkish style clothes, and men were having their portraits painted dressed up like Turks. But this is back in the 16th. And uh, this painting, again, uh, uh, scribed to Titian, shows a woman wearing a very de definitively uh, Turkish entari uh, garment. In fact, although the Italians and the Turks were tremendous rivals in the silk trade, and the Italians eventually, in many respects, gained the upper hand in large parts of the Mediterranean, there are still wonderful Italian velvets and textiles to be found in Turkey. One of the most impressive of these collections is in the Bargello, here on loan to Bruscatini's Genoa exhibition. And this shows us again that Italians, uh, now they, it's, it's, it's significant that these survived as yard goods, that they were never made into, into garments. Uh, but, it, but in fact, uh, it shows at least that they were highly respected as the valuable works of art they are, and it's nice that they've survived into our own time. So to close the circle here with, uh, with the Genoese exhibition of a couple of years ago, um, Italy and Turkey have always had uh, the, the Italians and the, and, the, uh, and the Turks and the, uh, the Renaissance and the Rena Renaissance Italy with its plethora of little states and the Ottoman Empire uh, are both symptoms of a, of, a, of a thousand year relationship which goes on, uh, which is still going on today in many respects. The, the, item from the, from the Biennale in, in, in Venice being one example of that. And what we see here is something that used to be thought of as, oh, isn't that interesting? It's fascinating. These people actually knew about each other, even though they were hundreds of miles apart and couldn't travel by jet airplane from one city to another. That in fact, it's all part of a unified or partially unified Mediterranean culture. And what we see in the relationship between the Ottomans and Italy is only one facet of a broader east-west relationship that has enriched the material culture and the art of both sides of the equation for well over a millennium. Thank you. <laughs>